Welcome back to The Next Big Thing. My name is Chris Gennady, Global Head of Research at Wisdom Tree. And today I am joined by, for the last episode of 2023, Mobin Tahir, my colleague, my friend. We just saw each other in London. He is a uh, director within our research team. And Mobin really spends his time flying around all the different European countries, uh, talking about different uh, thematic investments. A lot of energy transition. There's a lot of appetite for that uh, in Europe, maybe not as much in the US, but uh, I'm sure we're going to be diving into those topics. Uh, Before we begin, I do need to state the following to clarify the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Wisdom Tree, uh, and we're both from Wisdom Tree, so nothing different there and they are subject to change. Anything we present in this podcast is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast research, nor as investment or tax advice. The information and opinions expressed in this podcast are not a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any securities and reliance upon them is at the sole discretion of the listener. Please remember past performance is no indication of future results. So with that out of the way, The benefit of it being already December, if you can believe it, uh, and basically halfway through December, Mobin, is we can kind of look back on the year. We can kind of see what what were we thinking in late 2022 and did it come true? So, So Mobin, I am interested, as you've gone around Europe for the past 12 months, what performance-wise in thematics has been surprising, surprised you, surprised the investors, uh, and what might you have been expecting uh, when we started 2023? Sure, Chris, a great way to start. And uh, thanks uh, very much, certainly, for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think uh, there were certainly a lot of surprises. When we talk about thematic investing, of course, we typically say that Thematic investing is all about looking at long-term mega trends. These are expected to be trends which can outlast any economic cycle and so forth. So investors really take a long-term view when when putting their money behind some of these themes. But having said that, of course, it doesn't mean that any of these themes are immune to what's happening in uh, in the here and now. And in 2023, it was a year of uh, rapidly rising interest rates. And that meant that thematic investing certainly being uh, a part of the growth spectrum within the equities space was uh, was uh, something that faced headwinds. And largely investors were, you can say, prepared for that at the start of the year. We knew that inflation was high. We knew that central banks would react to it. And, And therefore, there was this expectation that uh, some of these growth-oriented strategies will perhaps uh, face those challenges from uh, the the gravitational pull of monetary policy. But certainly, uh, the the biggest positive surprise came in in parts of the market which uh, defied some of those gravitational uh, forces, uh, and of course, AI being being one of them. You and I we've talked about this. It was uh, maybe hard to foresee how big a trend it would become over the course of the year. And uh, how how its its performance really seems to have ignored what the Fed has been doing uh, all year. Uh, so there have been pockets of very positive surprises, certainly in 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 AI and related themes, and some uh, disappointing uh, parts of uh, the growth spectrum. Certainly, you mentioned energy transition; it's a hot topic in Europe. But uh, the the narrative over the course of the year has evolved uh, in, in a way that investors are now thinking about when might be the right time for them to go back into this theme, given market performance uh, this year. So uh, there's been a lot of divergence. You tend to see that, OK, when growth is doing well, maybe everything does well. That's certainly not been the case this year. It's been a case of uh, some themes really taking off thanks to all the interest uh, uh, in, in the fundamental technologies, you know, AI being the, the key example there, and some uh, doing exactly what they are expected to do in, a, in an environment of rising interest rates. But uh, that doesn't discount the fact that next year is certainly going to be another interesting one uh, for thematics. And Mobin, uh, 
we, t we talked about energy transition in there. You alluded to it. I know the the funny thing is I, I was going around uh, various European cities uh, in October, and the, the main topics that I was presenting on were cloud computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence. Uh, there, there's obviously a tight-knit relationship between all those, but the clients and this this can certainly be the case some some in uh in in certain regions more than others uh when they ask questions they would always sneak a question in on the energy transition uh because the the feeling i had is a lot of people have put a lot of money uh into those areas uh whether hydrogen whether solar power wind power whether mixes of of these things and this past year, uh, it, it really, you know, performance wise, as, as you look at the total portfolio, you're, you're seeing green in the Magnificent Seven, you're seeing green in, you know, things closely related to AI, NVIDIA, uh, and you are not seeing uh, green by any stretch in sort of this idea of the energy transition. So I know, I know it's a mega trend, but um, did, did anything change in 2023 as relates to uh, as we sometimes call them, the green or environmentally oriented themes like energy transition. You're right, Chris. Uh, we, we haven't seen uh, green in terms of performance in the green strategies, which is uh, which is uh, has been, of course, uh, disappointing as we've seen uh, green uh, performance numbers in, in, in AI and elsewhere, like you mentioned. Uh, so, of course, uh, one thing that a lot of investors are recognizing is that maybe we are approaching the point of peak pessimism when it comes to some of the energy transition related themes. Uh, just take uh, renewable energy as an example. In 2023, by some estimates, and this, this number I took from a, a Bloomberg report, um, that there is probably going to be a 50% expansion in solar power installations across the world in 2023. And many people around the world are talking about how 2023 might be really the year that solar power becomes mainstream, becomes uh, well deployed around the world. New regions are certainly expanding their capacity in, in renewables, particularly solar. But when you start looking at uh, market performance, uh, that, that doesn't tell the same story. Uh, the hope is that markets right now are fixated on monetary policy. And of course, uh, that that macro headwind is forcing uh, prices down. But ultimately, all the underlying work that's happening in developing all this renewable energy capacity around the world is going to translate into positive performance once the macro headwinds uh, alleviate. And uh, that, that really is key. Um, Parts of the uh, energy uh, transition space are uh, uh, are maybe facing headwinds in the way that, uh, like we take offshore wind, um, we've we've seen some news um, uh, this year where some big projects have had to be shut down because financing costs have have risen. And of course, when rates rise, if you're building a large uh, wind power plant, uh, that 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 means it, it creates challenges for you if you've locked in a price with with the local government at a certain level, and of course your financing costs have have gone through the roof. Maybe that means you have to halt uh, operations on the development of that project. But uh, if interest rates turn the other way, or maybe if interest rates peak and maybe start to ease, uh, some of these projects will certainly be the first ones to uh, recover from from the headwinds we've seen this year. So. Uh, I think uh, naturally, I think this year it, it was a case of uh, it, it was an interest rate story for the energy transition. Uh, the underlying stories still remain strong, uh, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's uh, electric vehicles, whether it's uh, uh, the battery space. We're, we're seeing lots of very exciting things happening. Um, and the hope is that all of that excitement in terms of technological development and progress will ultimately accrue in the form of uh, earnings for businesses and uh, and all the negative sentiment in markets will dissipate. 
And, and Mobin, one of the things I, I love, and I had the pleasure last week to uh, hear you uh, discuss things uh, with some, some journalists in the room, but um, I, I feel like when, when we get into these topics, the most fun thing is when we start getting into the specific ways in which the energy is uh, developed. And, and a lot of people who take the time to, uh, to listen with us uh, regularly, they were, they were probably watching thematics far before this podcast launched, and they were watching uh, Hydrogen as, as one example uh, in sort of 2020, 2021, where, um, you know, you look at some of those stock charts uh, and excitement probably isn't a strong enough word uh, to, to cover it. Uh, you know, vert vertical lines in, in both directions, in, in a sense, on, on one hand, uh, euphoria, on the other hand, uh, peak pessimism uh, and realization that uh, it, it's going to be some time before we're able to uh, just drive a hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicle down and fuel it up and take long trips and, and all the rest. And so you have certain things that you feel like are already out there. You, you can fly across the English Channel, you see the wind farm. So the, this idea of wind onshore, offshore, it's progressing. You, you mentioned solar power, it's progressing. Um, you mentioned things like hydrogen, you feel like the world wants it, you're not really sure how much it's progressing. Um, and there was the, the euphoric uh, bubble in sort of 2020, 2021. Uh, and then you have things like uh, nuclear, where on the, on the one hand, maybe certain countries start turning on old power plants that they had shut down. Or uh, on the other hand, you, you, whether it's small modular reactors or uh, safer uh, designs that uh, might work better and be more efficient, you, you have that going on. Uh, all of these things seek to mitigate or eliminate carbon emissions, depending on how they're done. But, but Mobin, I'd, I'd love for you to sort of walk us through the state of play in some of these green technologies as we end 2023 and get ready for 2024. So one uh, very interesting story that came up recently was uh, Virgin Atlantic, the the airline. They they did a, a, a transatlantic flight um, on 100% sustainable aviation fuel very recently. And sustainable aviation fuel we know is made out of uh, used cooking oil and animal fats. And that was the big headline that uh, media reported that uh, Virgin Atlantic flew a, a Boeing 787 on used cooking oil and animal fats. And um, the, 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 the founder of Virgin Atlantic, uh, Sir Richard Branson, uh, he actually joked that in the past, whenever there's been a, a first for him, uh, a transatlantic first for him, whether it's a, a boat journey or a balloon journey, he's had to be pulled out of the ocean. Uh, but this time, uh, the, the plane actually landed uh, at the airport on the other side of the of the of the Atlantic. So this was a, a very uh, monumental development. Um, yeah, last year in 2022, there there were other test flights done. The Royal Air Force in the UK, they they flew a, a plane the size of uh, an Airbus A330, so a fairly sizable airplane uh, called the Voyager, the RAF Voyager, uh, again on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that example is the energy transition space is is evolving very rapidly. And sustainable aviation fuels is one example of a new technology that can help us decarbonize a very vexing uh, challenge, uh, which is decarbonization of aviation. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we've got electric vehicles, but what do we do for, for, for aviation? Uh, that's been the big challenge. And sustainable aviation fuels, although they are only 0.1% of 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 all aviation fuels right now, uh, they, they promise a lot of growth because even if we say they, by the end of the decade, maybe they become 2% of all fuels, that's still a, a huge growth for the market itself, going from 0.1% to 2% of the market share. And in, in the mix of all the technologies that will decarbonize aviation, you mentioned hydrogen, they, they will play an important role. So we know that alone, a single technology won't do, do the job sustainable aviation fuels, maybe they decarbonize some 
uh, parts of aviation. The exciting thing about sustainable aviation fuels is uh, you can immediately decarbonize your existing engines and reduce your carbon footprint by 70% overall uh, of that plane journey. Um, but hydrogen, uh, we know that uh, companies like Airbus and others are looking to develop hydrogen as a commercial solution to use hydrogen-powered airplanes. Uh, the challenge there is with hydrogen, of course, you have to build a brand new engine um, which can fly on hydrogen and you have to produce enough quantities of green hydrogen, which again is not being done at scale. So you almost have to build the technology to use the hydrogen, but you also have to uh, produce clean forms of hydrogen, which is referred to as green hydrogen in sufficient quantities. So hydrogen is a little bit behind, but that's that's the beauty of 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 uh, of investing in some of these themes that there's there's almost a diversification by time horizon. Maybe sustainable aviation fuels are a, a solution immediately, uh, whereas hydrogen could be a solution that comes in the years to come. But alongside that mix, we see some interesting examples of uh, battery powered small aircrafts as well. Uh, certainly in uh, in planes that only have to do short journeys. And we've seen examples of uh, companies potentially looking to introduce uh, uh, aerial ride-sharing aircraft uh, in, in, in the next uh, two to three years, possibly uh, going entirely on a lithium-ion battery. So almost the same battery that uh, powers an electric vehicle. Uh, so in a nutshell, the idea is that uh, the energy transition to me is a space of very exciting innovation. It's a space which will be driven by uh, technological innovation and progress rather than policy framework. Of course, policy has to set the way. Uh, it, has to, uh, it has to set the direction of travel. But ultimately, industry has to come up with all of these exciting solutions which... Uh, which will uh, which will solve the problem of of tackling climate change. So, we see lots of exciting things happening there, and uh, our our job certainly is to is to highlight some of those stories to investors, uh, and and put it in in an investable framework, uh, because investors hold the key to unlocking the potential of some of these technologies. And 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 Mopin, speak, speaking of these technologies, um, there was. I, I'm not even sure to if the right way to phrase it is development, because if I say development, people might assume the the cars exist uh, and you can go to the dealer and buy them. But Toyota made an announcement, um, and and this this relates to the whole battery chemistry discussion, where right now there are certain metals that are widely used in what we term lithium ion batteries. Um, the uh, nickel manganese cobalt uh, chemistry is one of the more popular uh, chem chemistries. Um, there, there's also uh, a, uh, an, an iron phosphate uh, chemistry as well um, that I know gets a lot of usage in China. And people might have been seeing articles about maybe thinking about sodium instead of lithium because it might be more plentiful and less costly. And you, so you're always seeing these shifts and changes in terms of battery chemistry. And, and frequently when people think of an electric vehicle, uh, the most expensive part is indeed the battery. Um, so if you can lower the cost of the battery, make the battery more efficient, maybe more people buy. And Toyota comes out and says, and, and Mobin, I know you just bought an electric car, so I'd love for you to put this into context for us. Toyota comes, comes out and says, and it gets published in the FT, um, you have a very, very small amount, possibly 10 minutes of charging with a solid state battery, and you're able to go 1,200 uh, kilometers, uh, roughly speaking. So an insane amount of distance, a very quick charging time, an expression solid state, which, again, very popular in 2020 and 2021. Companies like QuantumScape uh, had, had a huge market cap, but the chart doesn't look that much different than hydrogen in the sense that you have the euphoric period uh, and then you have the pessimistic period that follows it. And again, you have the realization that if you go to a car dealership today and you say, are they using a solid state battery? The answer is unequivocally no across the board. 
but Toyota got a lot of attention and it's hard to know how close they might be a year or two years, three years, who knows, but Mobin, I'd love for you to help us put this solid state battery uh, noise into better context. Sure. And uh, at the start of uh, 2023, I wrote a piece uh, which was somewhat critical of uh, Toyota's strategy on electric vehicles. Um, and my my tone perhaps echoed the sentiment of uh, markets as well. Toyota, among other Japanese uh, Automakers were being criticized quite uh, heavily at the start of 2023 for their uh, lack of uh, direction and, and vision on, on the electrification front. And uh, at the start of the year, Toyota's leadership came out and, 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 and voiced some skepticism towards uh, electric vehicles and batteries as well, saying that maybe... Uh, that's not the only solution, which was a fairly reasonable thing to say that uh, it's not the only solution. It might be a, a part of uh, many other solutions. You know, hydrogen could be a solution. And we know that Toyota has had a hydrogen powered car uh, on the roads in various parts of the world for, for some time now. Uh, Toyota has been uh, doing very well on, on the hybrid front. But on pure battery electric vehicles, Toyota was missing um, a, a clear strategy and and it was losing on on its market share uh, so toyota had to do something really special it had to pull a special uh, trick uh, to to reignite uh, market's belief that look toyota has, has always been a, a behemoth in the automotive space and it's it's going to remain a behemoth in the automotive space and solid state to me is uh, possibly that technology which might help uh, Toyota do that. Uh, Toyota had some change in leadership as well. Maybe that catalyzed uh, some additional um, impetus uh, towards uh, this solid state uh, development. Of course, not to say that they, they started developing this this year, but maybe the, the change in leadership catalyzed that process. And and like you said, uh, you know, one of the biggest concerns for any person that uh, is looking to adopt an electric vehicle is is range anxiety um, and solid state promises uh, longer range lower charging time possibly smaller battery you can start doing some very interesting things uh, if you if you have a more efficient battery you can uh, of course reduce the overall weight of the battery in the car and that therefore uh, make make the car uh, uh, more efficient uh, that way as well. Uh, some some interesting applications like uh, battery swapping, uh, like you know why why have a battery fixed in the car if you could uh, remove the battery and and put in a, a fully charged one. I mean, if if it's a smaller battery, uh, possibly those sorts of things can be done much better, and maybe that will pave the way for uh, the electrification of more heavy modes of transportation as well, which tend to take a lot longer uh, if uh, if you were just charging them with the with the current uh, technologies so very excited um, it's it's still something that is uh, is not uh, commercialized yet uh, in in electric vehicles like you said uh, the main challenge with solid state of course is is the engineering side the the, the science works the the, the solid state uh, chemistry does work uh, the the challenge is a sustainable process to scale up the engineering and and put these things in in electric vehicles, and if Toyota does that, maybe they can uh, they can earn back the trust of of markets uh, in in their in their leadership in the automotive space. Because uh, if not, we know that a lot of Chinese manufacturers are uh, taking up a lot of the market share, certainly in the electric uh, vehicle space. And I feel like in society, um, and it's different country to country. I know, I know. For instance, you go a lot to uh, the Nordics, uh, countries like Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark, Finland, and there, there's a certain attitude about EV adoption that might be there. Uh, that attitude may not be the same when I travel, to, say, Austin, Texas, or uh, Miami, Florida. Uh, in the U.S., so everywhere in the world sort of has their uh, different uh, feeling 
uh, towards transitioning uh, away from what we might think of as the older internal combustion engine technology. But Mobin, you, you've you've set a stat in the past that stuck with me um, because when you think about it, you can't help but say it's 100%, 1,000% true. And that's that was something like 96, 97% of the time your car is sitting somewhere, uh, probably in either a garage, the street, uh, the parking lot outside your office, whatever the case may be. The, the main point here is it's not being driven. So you've paid the money. You might still be paying the money, whether it's a lease or a loan or whatever the case may be. And the car is literally doing nothing. It's ta it's taking up space. You might have to pay for the parking. Um, so it's still causing you to keep paying and keep paying and keep paying. But if you had an electric car, and, and Mobian, I'm not sure if this is possible yet, but I know you've written about it, you've talked about it, this idea of the battery has energy in it, just, just like the gas tank. So right now, my car is in my garage, the gas tank does have energy in it, but I can't do anything. I, ca I can't sell the gas to someone else who might actually be trying to go on a trip or trying to run uh, the dishwasher or the washing machine. But if it was a battery, you could, in theory, connect back into the house and somebody who needs a bit of power uh, could pay you, the car owner, for the power that is in that battery. And so in theory, you might have a scenario, depending on the, the power prices, where a gas-powered internal combustion car, it is still just sitting there, as it always has, but an electric vehicle starts paying you uh, to own it, which um, is is a compelling proposition. Again, depending on prices of of power and the extent to which you you can do this, and and I know AI also plays uh, a bit of a role in this. But um, Mobin, is it possible as an EV owner, which I know you are, for you to actually start selling in the UK some of the power from your battery into the grid when you're not using the car? It's a very exciting uh, new technology, Chris, and. Uh... The, the, the technical term used in the industry for this is vehicle to grid. And, and it says uh, exactly, it means exactly what it says, vehicle to grid. So there's energy going from the vehicle to the grid. And the, the, the case for this technology is, is uh, quite, quite simple. The idea that if, say, the grid was fully reliant on renewable energy, we know that renewable energy is an intermittent source of energy. We don't know what, what you might do when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. Well, you would rely on energy that you might have stored when the sun was shining um, and uh, the wind was blowing. And we know that the world is developing energy storage systems at the sites of uh, renewable energy development. But we don't just have to remain limited to those large energy storage facilities when we've got these electric vehicles which are well distributed around the world and they are close to the consumers who are actually going to use the electricity and like you said uh, those vehicles are standing parked uh, most of the time and not being used so an average person who is uh, using their car for their personal means it's it's possible like you said that that the car is remaining parked 95 96 maybe even more uh, percent of the time and if the battery itself is the most valuable component of the vehicle that means that you're you're paying for the car uh to just be parked outside so that it's there when you when you need it and you're only making use of it 4% or 5% of the time when you're actually behind the wheel and on the road so uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to start utilizing this well-distributed uh, energy storage that we already have. The more electric vehicles we sell, the more well-distributed energy storage we will have. And uh, the, the aim now is going to be to make sure everyone is incentivized to, to start using the technology. Of course, if you're a government, you would be incentivized to encourage this technology because if you encourage more people to utilize the energy in their batteries, then that reduces the load on the grid. If you are a consumer 
you would be incentivized if the economics make sense. Uh, and the economics might make sense because uh, if you can sell back to the grid at a time when you don't need your battery to be fully charged, uh, you can maybe offset some of your overall charging costs, maybe even generate some revenue. If you are charging at a low tariff, say overnight, and selling back at a high tariff during the day. Uh, so those are some interesting uh, possibilities and, and incentives that can encourage people to adopt uh, this technology. Um, and if you aren't even selling back to the grid in the first instance, we can certainly see uh, people powering, uh, like you said, uh, the bulbs and their electronic appliances in their homes. Uh, to your question, can can I do it with, with my electric vehicle? Um, I, I would love to, uh, but there are two main challenges with that. One, uh, the car itself has to uh, offer that facility, the, which is bi-directional charging. The idea being that can you... Uh, give charge back to the grid instead of just uh, taking charge from the grid. Uh, some cars have started offering that as a way to uh, distinguish themselves from the competition. And of course, we know that most electric, uh, most uh, companies that make cars now know how to make electric vehicles. Uh, how are they going to distinguish themselves uh, from the competition? Uh, this is one possible way that they have identified uh, to to do that, so some cars have started doing that. The car that I drive has uh, is not yet uh, has not yet adopted that technology. Um, but the second thing is, of course, uh, there has to be regulation for for the grid to to do that, and and there will be uh, some standards that have to come for for this to become uh, the the norm and this to be adopted more widely. Uh, when might this happen? Of course, we, we don't know. But what we do know is that, uh, like you said, some, some parts of the world are, are more, um, more uh, welcoming to the electrification uh, theme. Um, and even in the U.S., like uh, the state of California, I've recently read, have, uh, have come out and uh, made some very... Uh, positive remarks about this technology, this vehicle-to-grid technology. We know that California as a state has has been pushing the electrification of cars for for some time. So, any further progress on that theme, uh, they're they're looking to facilitate. And uh, other countries around the world will probably follow suit. It, it's possible we'll see that one uh, jurisdiction, one geography, one state, one country might might do it. Uh, and others might see that that's a test case and it's working and we may see more uh, uh, wide adoption of the technology. Uh, but but companies are, are working in this space and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be something in the next two to three years, not, not the next 10 to 20 years. So what I want to do, and this is something uh, we've, we've never done um, on this... Uh, you know, next big thing podcast, but um, I know Mobin is up for uh, the challenge. I, I didn't even tell him I was going to do it this way ahead of time. So this is completely off the cuff. I'm going to flip it around. So we're going to pretend for the next 20 or 30 minutes that Mobin is the host. The reason we're doing this is you could tell Mobin is following uh, vehicles, uh, energy transition, renewable power, I mean, th this is what a lot of the European investor base wants to discuss. And that's what Mo Mobian is rarely, we're lucky to catch him between uh, flights uh, at this uh, at this stage. So um, I cover a lot more of things like AI and software and cybersecurity. So Mobian, we're going to flip it around. And if you wanted to pretend you're the host and, and pose some questions my way, um, I think uh, that that could be a bit of fun here as we uh, as we close it out in the second half. What an exciting opportunity! Uh, thanks, Chris. And uh, certainly, I know you you have uh, uh, a lot of uh, insights in into the world of AI. It's been a hot topic this year. Uh, one thing you 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 tend to see is you look at these headline indices. You see. Uh, you know, you, you see the, the, the NASDAQs and the S&Ps of this world being driven to, to record highs. And uh, a lot of that is attributed to, of course, uh, the, the, the AI theme. And uh, people sometimes draw parallels to what happened during the, the 
you know the tech uh, uh, bubble uh, two decades ago uh, how do you how do you see i'm curious uh, how do you see uh, those comparisons being made uh this time versus uh, you know the tech uh, bubble t- two decades ago and where do you see the ai theme going next from from all the excitement that we've seen this year what's next for the theme for first of all Mo- mobin is scaring me here that it's uh, already two decades ago that uh we were talking about the tech bubble um i've got uh, i've got a big birthday coming up in 2024 40 um so uh mick when it, when he says statements like that makes me uh feel feel a bit old but um thinking back to that period of time the interesting thing even though the returns and the euphoria and that that's just a, a part of human nature that you feel like is always there um there there are a lot of tricks being uh played in the sense that there are a lot of uh quote unquote dot coms being added to the names of companies you, you don't really see that as much today there there were a lot of uh you know new statistics uh impressions clicks uh th- things of that nature statements like uh well cash flows don't matter earnings don't matter even in some cases revenues uh don't matter um so there there are a lot of uh elements uh that were sort of a, a bit more uh risk seeking uh than what we have today because what we have today if we think of the magnificent 7 where a lot of the returns have been uh centralized uh even a company like Nvidia which look uh the valuation of Nvidia right now at this moment might be too expensive but it also might not be and the reason it's not clear is i just saw a new statistic from uh, a Piper Sandler uh piece which was cited in a in a Barron's article uh which was indicating in 2027 the AI accelerated chip market could be 400 billion uh dollars. Now, I I basically did a double take because I feel like a few months ago I was seeing different statistics and uh I I don't know how people come up with this, but there was a different stat which was basically saying it's going to be incredible growth 3 years and we're going to go from where we are today uh which is still quite small in the scheme of things um to a level of around 150 billion. So in a few months uh they've changed the estimate 150 billion for AI accelerated semiconductors up to 400 uh billion. Um and I I don't know if those things are right, but if you step back and you say Nvidia is at least close to maintaining dominant market share uh for this period of time and that market does grow to a huge extent as predicted um maybe Nvidia is too cheap um so you sort of step back and you say what a, what do you see when you see Nvidia's fundamentals i mean the the margins are amazing the profits are amazing the revenue growth seg- segment by segment particularly in, da- in data centers is amazing uh that there is real cash there they are really putting products out um and so even if Nvidia might be a bit on the expensive end of the valuation spectrum there are genuine reasons you can point back to when you look and you say wow this company has increased somewhere on the order of 700 800 billion USD in market cap in less than a year and you you then extend and you say Microsoft Apple Amazon i mean th- these these are real businesses um many of them have been around a long time many of them have reinvented themselves uh numerous times they may not have started as ai focused companies but as you go down uh the track here you're seeing more and more of an ai focus the these large language models that are often discussed i know gemini just came out last week uh but gemini is now competing with llama from meta it's competing with uh gpt4 maybe soon to be gpt5 we'll see uh between microsoft and open ai um but ultimately these models are very very expensive to build and train and develop and run and only the largest companies at least so far are in the paradigm that's currently being used only the largest companies seem to have the wherewithal the resources and the computing infrastructure to be able uh to push the envelope that way and so what what we will have to see is what about profitability 
from specific AI applications. This year, I know uh, Wisdom Tree works a lot with uh, Professor Siegel, our senior economist, um, and he's been citing, uh, if, you, if you listen every week to Behind the Markets, he's been citing that uh, the productivity growth this year has been uh, pretty remarkable. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily work that you can immediately say, oh, it must be AI, and you see the conclusive proof right there that it's, it's AI and it's you know, large language models and all these things. Uh, maybe AI is playing a role. We'll have to see what, uh, what research has done uh, in the coming uh, months and years on that topic. Um, but uh, AI is an important piece that could help with productivity. And we have the example of Microsoft putting out uh, their sort of co-pilot service within Office 365 as one example. The reason I like to cite that is you have a huge platform. Hundreds of millions of people use some version of Office 365. They now have the option to spend $30 per user per month. So if you think about that, it's almost like a distinct advertisement, which is telling you, directly, if Microsoft reports the numbers, and you have to imagine if they're good, they're going to report them, um, you basically see the willingness of the general business user out there to pay an incremental $30 per user per month on top of what they're already paying. And if you see a huge adoption, then it's crystal clear. The, the case is made. Generative AI is something that most companies want to use. Microsoft is you know, enhancing the software that you've already bought and you're already familiar with. And we, we basically go on our way. But similarly, if a year from now we're looking back and we see, wow, the adoption rate, it's, it's really low. It's not really, it's, it's basically either that the technology isn't doing what we thought it would. The appetite is maybe for something different. There, there might be something we just don't know. Um, this year that we are about to go into, in a way, is really, in my opinion, where the rubber meets the road, because a lot of money, I mean, tens of billions of dollars per year is being spent by these gigantic companies. Now they have the money, but they're going to want to see a return on that investment. And that return comes from the AI is actually enhancing and increasing revenues. Uh, people are willing to pay more to access certain features and functionalities. This year is where we're really going to see a lot of that. And we'll also have to see if, in fact, the open source movement, that movement beyond just the largest companies sort of centralizing these resources, uh, is able to really gain significant traction. So I, I personally think we're going to learn a lot in 2024 about the economics uh, and the ways in which people can use AI to either increase revenues, increase profits, and really feed into the bottom line. Chris, you, you mentioned uh, the NVIDIA story certainly there. And one thing that we observe, uh, me here in, in London, and uh, we observe that, of course, uh, keen to get your thoughts uh, being in the U.S. Uh, on, on, this, on this particular matter. The idea that, of course, the U.S. is looking to reduce its dependence on, um, on parts of the uh, supply chain where you know they are de they are dependent on on uh, on uh, suppliers that that they don't uh, that that they can't fully um, you know control uh, in in a way. So the idea of onshoring or reshoring or friendshoring is is something that's very relevant to the semiconductor theme. But I'm curious because you mentioned NVIDIA and NVIDIA has been in this space for a very long time in, in terms of de designing semiconductors. But in terms of the actual fabrication of, uh, of the chips themselves, it's not something that you can just do overnight. You can't just build a factory and start uh, churning out chips uh, overnight. It's something that requires uh, a long time to develop You know, just the infrastructure, uh, behind the factory and of course these the skills and expertise to actually start manufacturing these things so i'm curious uh, to see uh, what you think in terms of uh, the general direction of travel that the us is taking in terms of looking to onshore some of the parts of the supply chain in the semiconductor space and whether or not that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing for the ai megatrend it, it's it's certainly 
eats up a lot of space uh, when you open up your uh, publication of choice, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, what, whatever the publication of choice might be. Usually the angle has something to do with Taiwan. We've got uh, an important election uh, coming up uh, within uh, Taiwan, uh, sort of in the short term here. And the thought is maybe uh, Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait becomes another sort of epicenter of these uh, geopolitical hotspots or geopolitical tensions, uh, similar uh, in, uh, you know, stress uh, to the system that a few years ago we saw sort of with Russia, Ukraine, more recently with sort of Israel, Iran, Lebanon, Hamas, uh, etc. And now uh, we, we know that if you are to listen to the Chinese government, uh, Taiwan is a part of China full stop. And uh, they want to make progress on that particular count. Exactly how they make that progress, that remains to be seen. And, and so we all sit in uh, perpetual speculation. Um, but uh, for multiple decades, as you've alluded to, um, certain companies like Taiwan Semiconductor, but Taiwan Semiconductor is not the only one, um, they have created an incredible ecosystem of talent, of expertise, know-how, uh, infrastructure, uh, to be able to make the world's most advanced chips. And this doesn't just mean they're making literally a silicon chip with transistors and that's it. Um, they have a setup where you're able to make uh, the, they, they call it uh, the, the chip on wafer on substrate, where uh, essentially if you see pictures of whether it's, um, you know, the H100 or uh, whatever the newest chip, uh, the Grace Hopper from uh, NVIDIA is being termed as, uh, you don't necessarily just see the chip and that's it. You see all these things around the chip, the uh, frequently the high bandwidth uh, memory. So these are additional memory units uh, located very, very close to the GPU uh, to be able to enhance the speed, the processing power, and the AI acceleration capabilities. When we're, when we're thinking of Alphabet running a 1.2 trillion parameter model and training a 1.2 trillion parameter model, um, if you don't have these uh, high-speed accelerator chips, uh, training this model could take a few years, and obviously that's just not going to be feasible. So you're trying to scale down the amount of time and put the memory closer and closer to where the calculations are made. So frequently you see these, they, they look like rather massive uh, devices. They're, they're clear, clearly not the historical just strip of silicon. But you, you think of what Taiwan has, has sort of built up um, there are different companies working together in concert and in an ecosystem to ensure that the customer who's paying 30, 40, 50,000 for whatever that uh, most recent instantiation of uh, NVIDIA's best processor is, uh, you know, those people are getting uh, exactly what they pay for. And so if the US or if Europe, um, you know, you name the Western region says, you know what? After the COVID-19 pandemic, I, I sort of got a bit nervous about supply chains. I look, I see that Taiwan is really pretty close to China. I don't know what China is going to do there. And if I'm depending solely, now think of what you can do in your life that doesn't use a semiconductor. Mobin and I are recording this podcast. Um, there is absolutely no way, Mo Mobin, I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mobin is in London, uh, England right now. There is no way we could even talk to one another without semiconductors. So all aspects of life cease without. Now, we don't necessarily need the NVIDIA highest end chip to get these things done. But at the same time, you, you do need uh, something of, uh, of some sort of power. And so every device that we are using on a daily basis uses chips. Society shuts down without chips. And so it is a high risk proposition if... Taiwan is literally the only place that these chips are made. So you, you've probably seen uh, the Chips and Science Act being passed in the U.S. last year. Um, you've seen headlines, Taiwan Semiconductor trying to build uh, in Arizona. You've seen Intel trying to build 
uh, in Ohio. You've seen Samsung uh, and some others trying to build in Texas. So we imagine all of these factories get built uh, in the coming years. Uh, they will make some chips, maybe not the most advanced, but some chips certainly will be made. Uh, there are also factories in Germany and other places throughout Europe. Um, so we are going to see this friend shoring onshoring that Mobin has discussed, but it's not going to be easy in the sense that building the factory for, in many cases, tens of billions of dollars uh, to be able to make uh, either the most advanced or close to the most advanced ships, that's only one step. Now you have to say, what about the people that have the right expertise? Um, there's a giant company uh, in the Netherlands, ASML, uh, which makes basically the only machine that you can use uh, it's, uh, the term is uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography. And this machine uh, comes in multiple 747s. It's uh, really gigantic. And ASML needs to basically embed people who know how to run the machine in the factory because it's that complex. Uh, you, you cannot just uh, you know, drop it off and say, OK, you've, you've, you've given us roughly $200 million. Uh, hands uh, you know, are wiped and we go on our way. So. The, the level of complexity in chip making is beyond any, it's, it's basically a science fiction story when I, when I read about it. Um, and transitioning, you know, and having factories is certainly one important part, but you also need the people, the expertise, the knowledge, the know-how, uh, the resources, a lot of water gets, uh, gets used in some of these processes. Um, so to be able to do all of that in areas outside of Taiwan, where Taiwan's been building this up for decades, it's not going to be easy. Well, Chris, uh, we recently uh, uh, did the survey uh, in uh, in Europe among professional investors where we asked them uh, what were the most uh, interesting themes that they were looking at for, for giving them long-term growth. And uh, the, the most popular themes that people chose naturally were AI at the, at the, at the top. Uh, it was there. Uh, cybersecurity was there, uh, the energy transition was there, and the fourth one was biotech. And and biotech is is one I want to get your thoughts on because I know there is this idea that biotech and artificial intelligence have uh, not just an overlap but potentially a big overlap. But it might be something that is relatively underappreciated uh, more widely. Now, when people think about cybersecurity, cloud computing, AI, they, they think that th th those are perhaps related themes. Uh, but when they think of biotech, maybe it's a less well understood space and maybe the impact that AI might have on the biotech and how the, the entire space might be transformed by better AI, more well-adopted AI, uh, is, is, a, is a fantastic opportunity that uh, some investors are, are aware of, others might, uh, might be starting to think about. So just curious to, to get your thoughts on um, how you see uh, the AI megatrend fueling the biotech megatrend. And, and, and Mobin, I, I agree in the sense that everything I see indicates that uh, at least what what companies are telling us in the C-suite when those surveys from uh, the McKinsey's and the Boston Consulting Groups of the world uh, come out and get cited in all the various places, um, basically trying to say, okay, where do you expect you'll be spending your technology budget in the coming year? Uh, AI is at or near the top of the list uh, across the board. So even if people are thinking or worried about recession and the like, AI still is there. Cybersecurity is either number one or number two as well, because you know, let's let's face it, uh, geopolitical risk uh, creates almost a, a reinforcing ad advertisement for the importance of being ready on those accounts as well. So AI, cybersecurity, it's no surprise that's where a lot of the focus, a lot of the money is being spent. And in 2023, you've seen a bit of a performance in both of those areas. Now, biotech is occupying. The complete opposite end of the spectrum. I feel like at Wisdom Tree, we track a thematic universe. We might have 42 or 43 distinct topics. And uh, for the last three years, um, biotech and related topics and themes has been near uh, the bottom of the list. So it's not just that recently the performance uh, hasn't been great. Um, in general, for the last three years, uh, the performance has been near the bottom of the pack. And, and yet, 
you, you and and part of this has to do i i personally think with just it's it's very difficult as a thematic investor to constantly readjust your expectations and timeline um where i know the the research that led to something like CRISPR. So Chris, CRISPR got uh, and gets a lot of attention because it can be utilized to, in a more precise way, uh, get into people's uh, genetics, find uh, particular areas and potentially edit them in a beneficial way. And there, there was just a, a new therapy uh, approved in the UK uh, called uh, CASGEVI. I think that's the pronunciation where essentially you're doing that to help people who have had uh, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia for an extended period of time. They've tried different other treatments, nothing has worked. And so there is uh, a new solution uh, conceivably that might uh, alleviate some stress, some symptoms. But you think and you say, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer uh, Duodna, the, uh, the two uh, researchers widely credited with uh, the CRISPR methodology, and they, they won uh, basically three years ago a, a Nobel Prize for their work. Well, that work was occurring essentially 10 or 11 years ago. Um, so 10 or 11 years ago, the technique is developed. Three years ago, the Nobel Prize is awarded. And just recently, one of the first uh, major Western markets approves uh, a therapy. And obviously, we're, we're used to ChatGPT in the sense that in one month, 100 million people are now using the software. Um, now that this uh, very expensive uh, therapy is approved, uh, in one month, nowhere near a million people are going to use it, but some people are going to use it and it's going to be beneficial and we're going to learn a lot and we're going to keep uh, progressing. And so in, in the biotech world, sometimes the time scales, they end up being a lot longer um, and uh, just co continually readjusting and reassessing our expectations, whether it's mRNA, whether it's CRISPR, whether it's certain types of, uh, of cancer therapies. These are some of the most important things in the world that people are researching and trying to develop solutions for. Um, but they certainly do not progress on anything like a software oriented uh, timeline. And, and as a thematic investor, frequently you're just looking at the entire menu. Uh, there are some things like software, which can uh, be deployed very, very quickly. Uh, there are other things, some, sometimes energy transition, things like fusion power, quantum computing, uh, biotech, these things, you, you, you know that they're big and the impact uh, can certainly be there, uh, but you just don't know um, how long you might have to uh, ultimately wait. Chris, I know uh, you've given me the opportunity to to throw questions at you, uh, which is which is great. But uh, I don't want to uh, over overstay my welcome on that. But I will ask you one last uh, question, certainly, and uh, uh, want to get your thoughts on the cybersecurity topic. Uh, since we're talking about generative AI and all the advancements there, uh, it's it's interesting. One one thought that that came up was this idea that uh, you know a lot of the cyber attacks that we 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 see uh, just take for example spyware or malware attacks which come in the form of uh, you know do dodgy emails which you get with with suspicious looking uh, subject lines or sender addresses and so forth uh, typically when we do cybersecurity training we are trained to look out for those uh, suspicious looking emails where the language might not be right, where the subject uh, line might not be quite right. Uh, but with generative AI, what, uh, what might be the, the next thing is these attackers, uh, these malicious actors, they might start using language tools to become more sophisticated in their attacks. And so the idea that cyber defense has to be equally sophisticated as well. So just curious to get your take on how uh, the generative AI revolution impacts the cybersecurity space and what you're seeing there. No, and, and Mobin, that's a great place uh, for us to kind of kind of close it out in the sense that few things are as important as cybersecurity. You mentioned uh, training. Um, with, within the way in which we focus on cybersecurity, we have eight distinct uh, areas. Uh, one of those areas is sort of dedicated to what we call the human factor. Uh, training is meant to enhance the, the capabilities of that human factor. And 
for, for all of the capabilities, whether you look at Cloudflare or CrowdStrike and you say, oh, you know, we're dealing with a billion attacks a day and, and all this stuff, complicated AI, dark trace, screening the emails, all, all these things, you, you realize training people is probably still the best thing that you can do. Now, generative AI um, obviously ups the game of the threat actor. People have probably heard about how, you know, it can it can mimic voices and leave voicemails and do phone calls and, you know, any anything that has to do with sort of the idea of language, natural language, being able to either speak words or type or write words or send text messages. Uh, these pieces of software can do um, and threat actors can point them in a nefarious direction uh, to try to most likely steal money. That's that's most likely uh, the case. But, um, you know, obviously uh, people on the, uh, the more positive side can uh, direct them to uh, also recognize uh, these uh, these types of attacks. So it is absolutely, especially as we go into an election year across uh, many countries, not just uh, the United States, uh, it's of the utmost importance to just recognize that uh, new things are available, uh, brought on by generative AI. Uh, and you, you have to have that, you know, secondary and tertiary look uh, every time you see information. Now, the most, if, if people are thinking, I'm going to make an investment in a cybersecurity theme, um, the, the notable point to also have in mind, and you've seen it over recent weeks as, as we make this uh, recording here on the 12th of December, but if, if you set up a paradigm in your head and you say, uh, what is the U.S. 10-year treasury doing? Because a lot of things, equities and, and, and all sorts of things relate back to the action of the yield of the U.S. 10-year treasury. And if that yield is trending in a more downward direction than an upward direction, so it's trending more towards 4% than 5%, let's say, uh, that downward trend creates an environment sometimes where software-oriented companies, high-risk companies, they might be generating a lot of growth and profits in the future. Uh, these companies can tend to see uh, a rather positive performance response partly due to they're running a good business, but also partly due to the fact that the U.S. 10-year treasury is moving more downwards than upwards. And so if you're, you're thinking of things that might have that type of a relationship where, let's say, uh, you're putting together your economic outlook and you're tending to think, okay, uh, we've seen uh, the peak in interest rates, which maybe we have, maybe we haven't. Um, you know, there, there's no way uh, to, to fully know these things with certainty. Um, but if those interest rates are trending more in the downward direction in 2024, uh, certain thematic investments, cybersecurity is certainly one, uh, could have a strong responsiveness in the positive direction uh, as we move uh, forward. So uh, that that is, I'll, I'll leave that as the final thought, and I will certainly thank uh, Mobin Tahir. So you, you can, if you, if you like what you've heard from Mobin, Mobin is writing all the time uh, at wisdomtree.eu. Uh, so you'll, you'll certainly see all of his ideas and more on uh, the blog. Um, and Mobin also uh, is involved with some other uh, podcasts as well uh, within Wisdom Tree. And, and I'll certainly thank uh, our audience today for the next big thing. Uh, and if, you, if you've liked what we've done over the course of this year, um, do not hesitate to, to rate, to follow. And the, the one thing that's a constant in thematics is change. And a one thing that's uh, a constant with this podcast is change. So we are going to keep trying uh, to change it up, uh, to do potentially more episodes in 2024, and to bring uh, even more thought leadership uh, to bear to these conversations. So with that, I thank everyone. And we'll look forward to coming back uh, next time. Take care.